I'm really enjoying the podcast myself, listening to it, actually. I didn't know about it till you called me, but it's great. Just brought back so many memories hearing the other guys talking. My special guest today is a marvellous actor who played one of the most likeable Sunhill coppers of all time. From death-defying stunts to fed rep victories, there's plenty to celebrate. Today, he's not only one of our most prolific and versatile voiceover artists, but a leading presentation expert as well. Joe Dow, welcome to the Build Podcast. Thanks very much for having me. It's very kind of you. Well, on behalf of one of the biggest Bill fans I know, Karen Carpenter, she's based in Australia. She's a huge supporter of the podcast and you are her favourite actor from the Bill all time. Oh, that's very kind, very kind. Gosh, I'm amazed anybody can remember me, to be honest, it's a long time ago. She asked me ages ago to get you on the show, so I think she's going to implode when I announce that you've done it. So, <laughs> Well, hi to Karen. Was it a nice surprise when you were asked to do this? Yeah, completely. I mean, I know they've started repeating episodes on the telly, but it's sort of, you know, several phases ago in my life. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and it was, I have such good memories of it. It seems everybody does when I've listened to the other podcasts. Everybody has fantastic memories of the time. And I must say, you, you sometimes I see CVs for actors and voiceover artists and they'll have a, a long list of accents and, and yet you listen to their samples and they all sound like the same voice. But you are a man of many talents because I was so impressed by your, your voiceover range. <laughs> I love the fact you could be doing classic FM one minute and then Iceland the next. So where did your ear for accents come from? And when did you work out you could you had all these voices inside of you? I just think uh, very at a young age, I was interested in accents and uh, found that I had the uh, the kind of the, the nerve to stick my neck out and try other accents. Mm. And uh, it didn't, you know, that other people didn't. So uh, I don't know. I just think it's uh, I've got an ear for it. And uh, I mean, I've, I'm a bit, I don't mind embarrassing myself. So they go off track a lot of the time, you know, sometimes they're <laughs> terrible. And uh, <laughs> I think people put up with that and, you know, they, they get used to it. But I do enjoy, I do enjoy doing it. And you've done a, a fair amount of uh, video game voice acting as well. Is that right? Yeah, that stuff's really quite liberating, actually, because you get to do, I mean, I was, Raised on the RSC acting, I lived near Stratford when I grew up, and I saw a lot of, you know, big, grand-scale acting. And then, unless you're in the RSC or something, you don't really get the chance to do that kind of thing. So, uh, video games is kind of next because they say, right, what do you, what, you know, what will you do with this character? And then they throw another one at you. And uh, so, I've got to do my full-on Shakespearean uh, <laughs> range <laughs> when I've done those guys. So that's great. You know, you, they just really give you carte blanche. Oh, these days you've also got an, uh, another amazing string to your bow, being an executive coach. Would you mind telling us all about that? Yeah, I didn't kind of even know that existed and fell into it um, through a connection who'd been an actor. And then uh, I sort of thought, you know, I need to do, I want to do something else with the skills I have and the training I've had that's a bit less kind of centred on me, you know, because acting can be quite, you know, selfish in some ways you're looking at yourself all the time worrying about yourself and it was just interesting at a certain age to uh turn outwards a bit mm. and uh, so somebody introduced me to that and uh, it's been a very interesting journey and uh, i've worked quite a lot with well, a lot of corporate clients but also with um uh, foundations who work with people coming from the middle east and syrians refugees and so on and that's been absolutely eye-opening and mind-blowing really so being able to help and uh, and to find that in, in also in the corporate world, people have to present all the time mm. uh, in a way that, you know, you would expect to have a full on drama training for, but they don't, they just, they just get thrown in. And I think it's a lot, a lot of people's worst nightmare to stand up and talk to a room full of people and tell a story or entertain them and feel happy on their feet. So uh, improvisational skills and voice training and, body language and all that stuff comes into it in psychology as well so it's a it's a it's a great thing to put my energy into and it's probably something i guess that you, you never stop learning while you're doing it as well definitely definitely and it's a changing thing as well and it's being more accepted through, throughout the corporate world and the business world 
as we go. So uh, that's great. Yeah. I read that you specialise in helping people unlock their potential. Who helped unlock your potential in your life? Who who are your role models or heroes as, as you started your journey into acting? Quite a few people, really. I had uh, an English teacher who was really enthusiastic and uh, kind of encouraged me to do performance. And also, I was in the National Youth Theatre for many years, and uh, that environment was really encouraging, and you realised what was out there. And then uh, I went to drama school and uh, worked under Patty Rodenberg, who's a famous Shakespearean voice coach, and um, she was fearless and uh, really, you know, pushed pushed our boundaries. And then, actually, I was massively inspired by a lot of the other actors that I worked alongside, particularly in the bill. The... Uh, artists coming in from outside were, were incredibly inspiring as well as the cast themselves you already had a, a, a regular series under your belt with uh, no job for a lady <laughs> yeah that's a blast from the past yeah <laughs> that's right yeah yeah i've just we transferred you some photos from that i found check your email afterwards you've got some lovely photos of you and penelope keith brilliant who i i, I interviewed uh, I, I worked at itv for a couple of years and, and what a charming lady just uh oh she's a genius she was a genius and in fact there was a there was quite a hefty cast in that show <clears throat> as a young person coming out of drama school i was thought i was completely out of my league <laughs> george baker and uh well Penelope keith herself she had such style and class and was such an icon and uh but was very kind to me and uh laughed at my jokes which was encouraging <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you know put us through the helped me through the the, the terrifying experience which is live sitcom in front of a live studio audience and being filmed at the same time so there's a there's a very confusing thing of split focus you don't know where to whether it's the, the five cameras that you're focusing on or this audience which seems to laugh at everything you know because they're in a kind of state of hysteria so uh, it, it's it's a real special a speciality and she's brilliant at it although she did experience stage nerves before she went on which was quite encouraging to me because she was as nervous as everybody else oh wow wow yeah that's nice to hear actually you know yeah 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 but she handled it brilliantly and so how did the bill come along was, was that a straight offer for you how, how how talk us through how you were cast as barry they were sort of casting their net wide at the time to try and find they didn't completely know what they wanted so they said, I think they were looking at lots of people and they said, you know, what do you think as an actor you would like to play? Which, which is quite nice, you know. And I, and I said, I, I, I kind of was only really, I wasn't interested in playing a villain cop or, or a sort of golden boy or anything. I said, what interested me was playing it right down the middle, really, a, a, a normal guy who got him to the police and then face the moral questions that they would face, you know, that that the, the difficulties of having to uphold the law and then being under pressure and seeing whether that, you know, a normal person would cope with it. So that was what sort of sat in my head and I suggested that to them and they seemed to go for it and they said, right, let's let's try that. Um and we did um quite extensive casting sessions of which we filmed and everything and uh and I think I was quite brave in those days, and I just went. I went for it, and uh, and yeah, I was delighted to to get straight in. And and then and then it's such a an overwhelmingly exciting place to work. You know, you feel like you're in the best school in the world, really, when you're there because uh, you're supported technically all around, and then you know the, the story writers write to suit your character and where you want to go with it. So it was excellent. How on your radar had the show been? Had you seen much of it before? Uh, yeah, I'd, I was aware of it, yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. I didn't sort of have it on my target list. Actually, strangely enough, I have to confess, I had uh, said, as I, when I came out of drama school, being, you know, full of high ideals of Shakespeare and that, I'd said, well, I will never do soap, I will never play a copper, and I'll never do advertising. <laughs> and having said that, I've actually... Uh, I spent most of my career doing all of those things. <laughs> oh. In fact, I even said uh, I'll never I'll never work at sea and I did play a captain of a ship once <laughs> for, on, a, on a Navy film. So, uh, you know, I've, now now I realise if I ever say don't do something in the future, it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and how similar 
was the Joe Dow of 1990 to the Barry Stringer that you were playing? And, and what appealed to you about playing him as, as the character developed? It, it kind of got more interesting as I went on, really. I was amazed at how open they were. Mm. I started off thinking I was not somebody who would ever join the police, but that, you know, that if I approached it in this way with seeing how a, a normal guy would react to the extreme situations they're in, that really did become interesting. And actually, I did <clears throat> research with with the, some police and uh, realized, you know, they they were just normal guys trying to do a job. And that was that was engaging. So, uh, so yeah, it, there, there was certainly a part of me that, that felt very personal about it. So um, uh, that made it easier to play. You know, you felt you could explore all different sides. I mean, obviously, you know, there were bits of it which just, just weren't me, but um, they are quite disciplined, I think. That was the word that, had, that one of the police advisors said. These are disciplined people. And I thought, well, I'm not very disciplined, really. But uh, <laughs> So that's not me, but um, no. Well, I went out on on patrol with some coppers on the, the first day of research and got into a fight. Oh, really? <laughs> Which was quite dramatic, yeah. Oh. I mean, I stood back, but they got heavily involved and it was in a crowded marketplace and I thought, this is going to turn really nasty. <laughs> so it was quite shocking, really. Um, and, and I was amazed how how they kept their heads, how level-headed they were. Mm. And uh, I thought, blimey, if that's just day one, what's it like the rest of the time? Yeah, I did some filming with Birmingham City Police actually with, with uh, this morning, like five, six years ago. And the guy, I did the night shifts and uh, the guy handing over all the kit to me said, oh, don't worry, it's been quite quiet. It, it'll be quite chilled, Croc, you know, don't worry. <laughs> That's famous last words. And then I was in like this 110 mile an hour car chase, you know. But, no. but Yeah, and but what I couldn't believe is once this, this guy had... Um, they broke off someone else got them sort of thing and then then they were just chatting about the rugby and and like they yeah they, yeah that, like so that's reset. their everyday thing yeah yeah um it was extraordinary because i was really nervous i was so because it's you just don't do it every day do you but these these guys it's, it's they're a special breed of people i had so much respect for them but also know i'd have i'd have been hopeless joining the police or the army it's just not in my yeah my nature you know i just can't i i'm a, i'm a bit of a wimp really i suppose so it was quite an exciting time for the bill when you joined because they they'd only just moved to the merton studios yeah being there right at the start of that time what talk me through a day in the life of working at merton from your perspective when when it was all brand new and like you know sort of purpose designed yeah, they did. They did. When we were there, they did talk a bit about, you know, people said, oh, the old days up at Barbie Road, wherever it was. <laughs> yeah. But this seemed fresh. So, you know, it was our new our new playground, which was good. It's an odd mix of real and fictional. So, you know, a, a police station is quite a kind of corporate looking place and doesn't look that different from the offices where we had our dressing rooms and where the um the writers were in that. So you could sort of, one was melded into the other. So there was a strange sense of uh, unreality or uh, about that, mm. that, uh, that you really were there and that you weren't acting, if I remember rightly. And then the, and then we'd, we'd spend a lot of time, obviously, out on the road in, in southwest London. So as some of the other guys have said, though I've heard that, it, you know, I nicked someone on every single corner in southwest London. <laughs> you go past every, every bingo. Oh, yeah, yeah, we had a fight down that alleyway yeah. there. Or I, I was strung up from that building there. Or, you know, we broke into flats over there. It's, it's hilarious, really. It's my old banner. But it's, um, <clears throat> it's a bit like having someone else's memories, you know, when you, when you realise it wasn't real. But, yeah. <laughs> So they were pretty full on days. They worked as hard and the, the schedule was astonishing how much they, they got done. Um, and you'd be working a couple of episodes at a time sometimes. So you'd be going from one, you know, dramatic scene to another, which wasn't so dramatic. And uh, so it took it took quite a lot of focus getting used to that and the amount of lines you had to learn and so on. But uh, they handled us well and allowed us to form a group as young actors. I mean, the the group that I was in at that time uh, with Andy Paul and Hugh Higginson and 
Tom Butcher and so on, we sort of bonded quite well, really, because we were young, ambitious upstarts and um, sort of felt like we were the ones there to, to create the new drama. Mm. We wanted to sort of wipe away what everybody else had done. And, you know, all of us had similar kind of ambitions, really. That was a good thing. Oh, but the calibre of you all at that time is really strong. The, the chemistry, but the, the characters are so well defined in that era of the show. Yeah. You all have such good chemistry, but who are your who are your main pals over your three years? Who did you socialise with? Well, we all socialised, but Andy, I got on really well with. He was a lot more experienced. You know, he'd been a child actor and stuff, and, and he's a natural raconteur and salesman and storyteller so he was a really entertaining guy to be with but he also kind of had you know theatrical ambition he wanted to sort of see how a, another actor's opinion on things and because I always had a kind of eye to theatre that was going on outside or film and so on um, so he was always ambitious and interested in the world so he was great to be with um, Tom Butcher was he came in at the same time as me I think the same day and uh, we were kind of poles apart in terms of the characters we were playing. Yeah. He was he was like astonishingly like RoboCop, <laughs> kind of um, high cheekbones and uh, and uh, you know a, a tremendous actor, absolutely tremendous. You know he could kind of he had a great filmic face and could uh, you could read things going on inside him without him flicking an eyelid, which I was always incredibly impressed by. But he was kind of lively off screen. <laughs> Really lively, so uh, <laughs> there was always there were always interesting stories going on. And then there was an old there was an older generation, Mark Wingett and that, who um, had been at it for years, but were terribly entertaining and uh, welcoming <laughs> to us as well. Oh, wonderful! And Ben Roberts and Ben Roberts, of course. And uh, was there a moment where suddenly you were getting recognised? Presumably, before then, you'd you'd enjoyed walking the streets and going to the shops without any public attention but did, do you remember a time when that had suddenly changed i'm not sure it was a particular moment i just i mean it kind of grew on you and, and in fact we did um we did the, we did interviews with the press the newspapers and so on and you thought at that point you still thought well nobody's going to be interested in <laughs> me nobody knows who, the, who, who i am and then they, these these stories came straight out, and you thought, "Oh my God, <laughs> that's quick! <laughs> that's really quick! We really are in there." So, so yeah, I think that was an, a bit of an eye opener. And from then on, we were a lot more cautious um, about who and what, who we talked to, and so on. Hmm. Um, but once it was with you, yeah, that wherever you went, you were aware that uh, at the time that it was so phenomenally well followed. Mm. it's hard to compare to things nowadays you know when i said to my kids we had like 17 million viewers in some episodes sometimes more i think i could get my figures wrong but sometimes i think it was more than that and now you know a show is astonishingly popular if it's got five million so it really was you were it was the white heat of being recognized yeah in your era it had more viewing figures than eastenders did it really? Yeah, at, at, at times it was second only to Coronation Street. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, in a way, I was lucky because I was playing what I felt was a kind of... I, I'd always tried to adhere to playing a normal guy mm. and his experiences, as opposed to somebody who was extraordinary. So when I was recognised in the street and people said things and stuff, it, it was usually reacting to you as a normal person rather than sort of a, as a cartoon character so they didn't you didn't get lampooned or m mocked or you know taunted for it or anything because you weren't playing anyone unreal I think people connected I had some really nice letters from police officers um, who said I really uh, I really uh, connected to the process you were going through there you know that it, it, it resonated for them in, in experiences they had which was amazing I've got a few um, favourites of mine well there's a nice consistency Russell Lewis writes some of your finest episodes. Yeah. It's kind of a slow burn for Barry, and I guess there's an element of 
presumably you had to be a bit patient just to see where they were going to take you and and sort of ease you in it was a slow burn that's right yeah i'm not sure they were they weren't sure sort of you know how far to go and and i was glad of that you know because i was nervous going in there first i remember the first scenes we filmed in Earlsfield, i think it was in in an estate in a uniform and you're standing out there in the street and because of the cameras there is a thing that they can kind of leave you and film you from afar and it's not just acting you are the copper basically yeah. <clears throat> and then you get to reflect off people around you and how they react to someone in uniform so it's it was pretty real and that and, and i was shocked by that to start with so it was good to get a chance to you know uh, I, I understood why they didn't throw massive drama at you straight away and i was glad of that because by the time it came to some of the bigger stories I felt I was kind of ready, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a nice... Uh, well, he's, he's a bit of a ladies' man, isn't he, Barry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did get in the clinch a few times. Yeah, was, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Life doesn't follow art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I like the, the fact that they, they did that. They explored that. Um, it's a Russell Lewis script first called night and day and uh nina mark is the actress her her flat has been burgled supposedly that's you know, right. right that's it yeah yeah and i was schmoozing my way around to chatting her up that's oh. right yeah as as graham <laughs> cole says uh barry's offering his own kind of uh victim support you know uh <laughs> and you you, you make up they probably wouldn't be allowed to do that nowadays <laughs> no. so that, it's all a bit un-pc in some way. <laughs> yeah, yeah later they even have you uh going off for a bit of lunchtime fun you know and and eric has to go and follow you and see that you've barry's been reported by a neighbor for this this constable keeps on going into this house at lunchtime you know and (laughs) it's it's cool that they as you say they didn't just make him because he's a great guy he's a likable guy isn't he and he's a good copper but it's good that they had that that side of little bit of naughty side to him you know that uh, yeah yeah yeah, he was a real fella you know yeah well they yeah you know they're young guys uh, with all the testosterone that goes with it and given a uniform so you could feel the potential that it has i remember doing a long shot down streatham high street or something and they put the camera in the back of a van and filmed through a sort of glossed window a one-way mirror from a, on a long lens, so we were about a hundred yards away from the camera in uniform, and just walked and talked with real passers-by going past us. And the reactions you got were incredible. I got sort of, you know, every single person went, that went past had a different reaction to me in uniform. And um, I have to say that that there were. You could get you could get eyed up a little bit more than I would have found myself walking down the high street, which was shocking. I thought, oh my word, the power here that you know you can wield. Yeah. So that that was really an eye opener. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, as somebody, as somebody, one of the coppers that I talked to early on, when everyone a, a real policeman who I was researching with, I said, you know, how do you play? Who am I playing here? How do I get a hold of this character? And he said, well, the, there's the uniform, you know, that becomes enormous a part of what and who you are. It's a very strong outside face that you put on and people see it immediately and they react to it in their own way. So already, you know, it changes who you are inside. And that yeah. was the journey for Barry, yeah. Oh. But yeah, it certainly didn't, it didn't do any harm romantically. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Russell Lewis again delivers what, what I consider is is easily in the top five episodes of the bill of all time with cry havoc oh yeah what an opportunity for you that was badity power station wasn't it yes I forgot the title. Yeah. yeah oh that, that was amazing it was it was brilliant and it, and it all came together you know with um the stunt guys who were on it and uh the they so we went round to badity power station when we'd seen the script and uh the director said do you want to do this? You know, you could do this. And I was like, yeah, I just, ju- I just went straight for it, not realizing quite how terrifying it would be on the day. Um, mm. the, there's a scene where this character maps. I can't remember. I think I'm chasing him originally because he stabbed Larry Dan. That's right. Yeah. We go up and up 
to the top of Battersea Power Station and then uh, I, I have a tussle with him. He falls off and I fall off and I'm hanging there on some netting. Yeah. And uh, we literally, we really did it up the top of Battersea Power Station, which I see every day in London and uh, remind myself how high it is. And oh. when they said it's 100 foot up, 100 foot's actually, really when you get up there, it's an awful long way. Yeah. And, uh, and the stuntman, was very reassuring, you know, with you're going to have all these straps underneath your uniform and wires and safety ropes and so on, which did have, but it still felt like launching myself into nowhere with no parachute and no nothing. And it was only when I fell down and the rope went taut that, that, uh, you know, I felt safe. Uh, although he never didn't feel safe because I was dangling under a piece of scaffolding with a yeah. uh, hundred foot below me. Stuart Urban is a director and uh, he, he got that amazing shot over the top of you as, as you fall, and you are just, you're rocking back and forth. That's this right. drop all the way down. I mean, if I were in person, I'd shake your hand for this because it's an astonishing achievement. Uh, I hope you're proud of yourself. I was really proud of it, actually. I was so glad I went for it, but I'm not sure if I'd ever actually do it again because it really was no. terrifying. Yeah. They were experimenting with new cameras at the time and new, te- and new um, yeah. technology. I think they had a fiber optic cable which attached to the front of the camera. And, and so it was a flexible, thin cable that, you know, you'd usually use for a medical procedure. But it, it, it could take a full picture and, they, and they'd attach this cable to the end of a pole. And basically, as I went over the edge and fell down, they chucked the pole and sort of caught it again as after it had fallen about 20 feet. So that the camera fell with me effectively. Which is which was incredible, and no one—I no, don't think anybody used it for, for that purpose before. Nobody used fiber optic um, lenses before like that, and uh, it was brilliant. But um, I was re- I was hanging there at the end of this rope with all the crew up on the <laughs> scaffolding above me, and feeling incredibly vulnerable. And they were all cheering and going, "Way, hey, that's a take, right?" And I could hear the first assistant going, "That's it, right? Everyone is going to get a cup of tea." And I'm thinking, oh, no. "They've forgotten me. They've forgotten I'm hanging here." <laughs> so I was uh, going, "Guys, guys, uh, excuse me, I'm still here." I think they were winding me up. Uh-huh. <laughs> How about that for a cliffhanger? Joe has been left hanging on for dear life. Will he survive? Of course he will. He'll be back in part two of the Bill podcast, where as well as more memories from Cry Havoc and Barry becoming fed rep, we also chat about Joe's critically acclaimed role in cardiac arrest and my theory on what happened to Barry after Sun Hill. In fact, if you look on YouTube, you'll see why Joe has me in hysterics next time as we chat about his guest role, once more as a copper, in Sooty & Co. Next time on the Bill Podcast. My relatives never stop t- taunting me with that. It comes out at birthdays and Christmases. <laughs> the people have found that video off the internet, and uh, we were such a laugh to do that. And I think we had the same camera crew, or the same lead cameraman, Rolling, had gone from the Bill or was doing a sojourn in. Uh, sooty and sweet but, and I think it may have been through him he said come and do a bit of this oh. and uh, it was so hard to keep a straight face <laughs> arresting sweep who'd uh, <laughs> gone joyriding in the camper van <laughs> and uh, the camper van is like about two three foot tall yeah that's right and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, we had a police chase and everything and then uh, I think we cornered him down an alleyway <laughs> and uh, it's got a, it has a sort of, you know, the way Sweet looks at you, this club puppet. It's just kind of deadpan, but at the same time, quite challenging, really. So, you know, I'm thinking, right, I've got to nick this devil. And uh, I had to I had to walk up slowly like Clint Eastwood to the side of the camper van. I think it was a camper van. Yeah. And, and then bend down, I sort of bend double to put my head in, in, in sort of copper fashion and say, is this your van, sir, or whatever it was. <laughs> And, and there's this glove puppet looking at you, completely lifelike. 
And I don't know how many times we did it. 